listening to um, to, to you three and um, uh, uh, also the fact that that this that this wonderful book uh, um, figures minor and more major figures. I wonder, do do you have favorite philosophers? Can you say you have a favorite? And if so, would you like to tell us a little bit about your favorite? Ladies first. <laughs> I find it hard to pick a favorite because I mean they're all interesting in their own way and um, well maybe I could say of course some things surprised me more than others um, and I think one um, one thing I remember clearly that I thought oh I, I really have to look this up was um, Abu Zaid al-Balkhi on um, hygiene um, of body and soul and especially his the reference to the role of music in therapy so it was I remember um, that jumped out at me while I was translating mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I find it very hard to pick uh, one. Just make you want to break out your violin. See, <laughs> next time you have a cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're probably going to say Farabi, right? Uh, no. <laughs> would be possible. Would it would uh, be a good possibility? No, there, there's one topic, one topic, and then one author. Uh, the topic I was very surprised about was that there are so many different concepts of philosophy already in that early period. Because we normally think all oh, that was Greek. It was Greek philosophy in the sense that they took the concept of Aristotle and they interpreted it and uh, modified it a bit, but were more or less Aristotelians. I would say no, um, in the sense that if you compare the concept of philosophy by Al Kindi and that of Farabi, they are quite different already. At the same time, if you take other authors, let's say the Juan Safa completely different idea of philosophy, what philosophy is and what it's good for. But there are also minor figures, um, and, and now I come to the author, Abu Suleiman Sichistani, so that's my favorite. Uh, I always knew Abu Sichistani in the sense that he's a great uh, scholar of logic, he's written on logic, and I knew his uh, Simon and Hekma, so on the tradition of, of doxography. But I realized that uh, when he was discussing philosophy with uh, Tawhidi, it was on the concept of philosophy too. And uh, his argument is that uh, reason or the intellect is something wonderful, but it's very limited. And that uh, it must be criticized in the sense that if people think that by reason they can um, explain everything, they are quite wrong. And there is a critique of philosophy and of reason, which is, I would say, as uh, strong as the critique of uh, Razali later on. So in that case, he's a kind of predecessor of al Razali, and that's strange. He is uh, um, somebody who likes logic, somebody who makes a history of philosophy in his Siwan uh, al and at the same time is uh, very conscious about the fact that there are problems, or there may be problems. So we have a discussion on what philosophy is, already before Avicenna, and that, that was my surprise when I came out of the book. Uh, yeah, so you actually just mentioned my favorite philosopher of, all, of all time, namely Avicenna. Okay. Uh, but he's not in the volume, so I can't say him. Uh, he'll be in this, the next in volume two. Uh, so I guess the obvious thing for me would be to say Akindi, because I, I've written a book about him, translated his works together with Peter Porman, and I wrote the chapter in this book together with Gerhard Endres about Kokindi. But one thing about working on someone that much is that it almost guarantees they won't be your favorite figure anymore because you kind of get sick of them. He's, he's fantastic, mm -hmm. but you know. Yeah. Oh. So actually, these days I work more on uh, another philosopher who lived from the 9th into the 10th century named Abu Bakr al-Razi. Yeah. And he, he actually should be anybody's candidate for favorite thinker in this volume because he's really extraordinary. He has uh, kind of shocking views, in fact, sh so shocking that we don't know about them through works that survive anymore because they weren't copied and preserved because they were so appalling. So, I mean, to make a long story short, he agreed that God existed, but said that God is one of only five eternal principles that cooperate to create the world. So there's God, a soul, who is foolish, whereas God is wise, mm -hmm. matter, out of which the world is made, and then a time and place in which the world can be fashioned. And 
so he's uh, excoriated by other figures for having taught this, but even that's only one aspect of his view. So he has uh, an interesting theory of pleasure, uh, and he also wrote this massive output of medical works. So he, in fact, he was primarily a doctor and kind of did philosophy in his spare time. And he also has a sense of humor. He likes to tease his opponents and come up with kind of scandalous examples, uh, which I probably can't even mention because this might be viewed by children. Uh, and he's, he's just a fascinating figure, and I like him a lot. He, he may, by the way, relate to Abu Zaid al-Baghi. Mm. It's possible that he's a kind of link between Kindi, that Baghi is a link between Kindi and Razi, which is one of the things that's actually discussed in here more fully than it is anywhere else. Mm. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he will appear again in volume four. And that's interesting because... Does he will? He will. Um, I mean, we, we expect, of course, uh, Avicenna, uh, yeah. the impact of Avicenna, the impact of uh, Rushd in, in the 20th century, of Farabi, a bit of Farabi, of Ghazali. But there has been an impact of um, Razi too. He was rediscovered by some thinkers in the Arabic world. The most famous one is Adonis, the famous poet. Mm -hmm. uh, his favorite thinker in the old period is, is Razi. Oh. So he's good for something. Yeah. And let's okay. wait for the fourth volume. I'm in good company. Yeah. 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 Actually, you know, actually, maybe something that's worth saying about this volume is that the fact that it goes up to but doesn't include Avicenna mm -hmm. is in some way, it's almost the most important thing about the book mm -hmm. the, in terms of the, the conception of it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, first of all, the idea of devoting four volumes of this size to philosophy in the Islamic world is already kind of mind-blowing, right? I mean, most people would probably be surprised that you could do one book half this size on philosophy in the Islamic world, or they might even think philosophy in the Islamic world is an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a massive refutation of that. But another thing that the, that the periodization does is it uses Avicenna as a kind of... Um, nexus or uh, point of change within the tradition, which is exactly right, I think. So I wasn't there when you decided this, mm -hmm. but I totally agree with it. There's one reason why it was very easy for me to join the project, because I think this idea that there's philosophy before Avicenna, and there's kind of lots of directions and possibilities and, mm -hmm. and sub-traditions within this larger tradition, some of which survive and some of which don't, primarily because he decides which things to draw on which, and which not. And then after him, everyone responds to him with some exceptions, but hardly any exceptions. Mm -hmm. So he's really the kind of central fulcrum of mm -hmm. the whole tradition. And this is giving you the first part of the story and maybe even giving you a sense of where things could have gone if Avicenna had never been born. Mm -hmm. um, sort of like if you did a, a book on modern philosophy and stopped just before Kant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, when Kant, once Kant comes along, everything changes, mm -hmm. just as everything changed because of Avicenna. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you can think about what happened before Avicenna as a subject of study in its own right, and that's what this book does. Yeah. So if you have read volume one, you are prepared to read Avicenna and volume yeah. two. As prepared as you can be, <laughs> yeah.